we are very pleased to continue to educate not only our customers, but the entire market. Uh, my name is Taj Adhab, and I'm the founder of Lease Cake. Six and a half years ago, I had this crazy idea to put two random words together that rhyme with cheesecake. And it turns out now we provide real estate and location management services for tens of thousands of restaurant service-based retail customers to protect their locations and to reduce their risk. So part of our learning and our education series is it's important to make sure that people understand not only lease management, lease accounting, and protecting their locations, but also different strategies to help their growth. The market has seen some unprecedented uh, contraction from a new development perspective, lowest number of new developments in six years, the number of renovations that are needed for retrofits of existing retail space. I think it's at the lowest vacancy rate. So the market's been incredibly competitive as it, as it relates to people wanting to expand and outfit their locations for their beautiful grand openings, whether they're a five unit, multi-unit operator to a 50, to a 500, to a, you know, over a thousand. So part of our objective is to introduce new topics. And I think the most relevant topic here it is, uh, it's a few days after everyone had to submit their taxes, but I have never met anyone that wants to pay more in tax. We're saying, I'm not paying enough in taxes. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you MSC, used to be called MS Consultants. They are a tax cost segregation study expert, and it is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you the depreciation doctor, the head of business development at MSC, Jeff Hyatt. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for allowing us to uh, take part in this session with you all today. I'm psyched to be here. And, um, you know, uh, Taj, you want to start with questions or you want to? Oh, wanna... yeah, sure thing. Sure thing. So um, basically, Jeff, I you think you've got a, a very fascinating story of how you got into the business. Um, I'll just I'll start with this background. When I first learned about cost segregation studies, I was at Disney. I was a decade um, uh, at Disney as an Imagineer. And the first project was this 3,000 room hotel. It was $235 million. And you know, a great cost seg study, and this is way back in the day before there was tech, uh, they were crawling all over the plans from uh, design development documents, schematics, and construction docs, and as builts. And throughout that process, the Disney company saved you know, tens of millions of dollars. So that's when I learned about it. And when I when I met you and how prolific you are with multi-unit QSRs, um, you know, kind of it's a journey, right? To get to to where you are. So why don't you start with that? Like, how did you get introduced to insurance and tax? So back in the day, back in uh, the early 90s, I was selling life and disability insurance and needed a way to differentiate differentiate myself from all the other insurance jamokes that were out there. And so I started to work with clients um, to not only solve their insurance need problems with potential, you know, with uh, estate planning type of life insurance, but I would fund that by saving them money in their business. So I would help them reduce expenses on energy or credit cards or whatever the heck it was, a whole bunch of different things. And, and that was going fine. And I ended up enjoying by 94, 95, doing the expense reduction more than I did the insurance stuff. So I put the insurance on the side <clears throat> and began to focus more on the whole idea of expense reduction. And then in 99, <clears throat> met this CPA that was moving from Buffalo, New York to the Boston area. And um, he said to me, oh my gosh, uh, if you're doing all this work with these small business owners, they're going to want to know about this thing called cost segregation. You ought to offer that. And I said, what was it? And he explained it, accelerated depreciation. And I literally said to him, no, that sounds really boring. No, thank you. And he goes, hey, if your clients own real estate, they're going to be interested in this. So I asked some of my Domino's clients, Dunkin' Donut clients, um, Taco Bell clients about if they own real estate, because I had never even approached the topic. And they all said, yeah. And I said, would you want to find out if you could get faster depreciation deductions, bigger write-offs, blah, blah. And they were all like, yeah, that'd be great. So I started to make introductions and we started to do projects. We got a lot of traction going with the QSR space. And then uh, we ended up 
doing some seminars for the Mass Society of CPAs and a bunch of other societies of CPAs. And we went from doing five or 10 projects a year to doing, you know, a couple of hundred. At this point, we do a couple of thousand per year. We went from myself, an engineer, and a CPA back in 99 to we now have six CPAs and 19 engineers who do the, the work. So we, wow. we've got a, a big staff and uh, we go all over the country. We have six offices so uh, we can serve any market anywhere. Yeah. So um, double check your camera settings. I don't know if your camera's off, but we can certainly hear your audio loud and clear. Um, with regards to owning real estate, I mean, many tenants also do leasehold improvements. So the capital investment for getting you know your your location up and running whether it's 200 grand 500 grand i mean some of some of these operators when they sign up and become a new multi-unit franchisee uh it's a pretty significant capital investment so um does the same hold true for for those operators that are in lease spaces absolutely so what we find and this may answer a question um that would come up otherwise but what we normally find is that if the client has spent anything north of 200000 on a leased space, um, and typically they will, if they're doing even a refresh of a particular brand, and you, you know how those happen every five or seven or 10 years, everybody, all the, the corporate um, folks require an upgrade of the look. So even if it's only a couple of hundred thousand dollars, it will typically still make sense to do a cost seg because what it's going to do is not just get, uh, we don't identify the coffee makers and the particular equipment coming in. We're doing the wiring in the walls, the plumbing in the floors, the uh, items that don't typically come in and get plugged right in. We're doing the plugs and the wires back to the uh, circuit breakers and the plumbing and the grease traps and all the other stuff. And we am, are able to compile that and make it work for them um, to accelerate depreciation, reduce their taxes, and then redeploy those taxes to either help them pay down a loan they may have or help finance the next locations project without having to take as much debt. Got it. Got it. So is is the layman's term for this or the way the best describe it? And I used to be a CPA 15 years ago. I, no, for 15 years until I realized it wasn't fun. Maybe that was 15 years ago. Um, but what I what I think I've heard you say and how cost seg works, uh, just for the broad audience, we've got a, a great number of attendees, definitely on the finance side, but also others that are owners too. Uh, when you say it's accelerated depreciation to save taxes, is one way to think about it if you've got, let's say, a $500,000 improvement uh, in outfitting your retail space, whether it's 1,500 square feet or 6,000 square feet, that 500,000, if 100,000 of it is, let's say, kitchen equipment, rather than depreciating that entire remaining $4 million over a, a longer period of time, right, 39 years, if your kitchen equipment can be inclusive of, like you said, the wiring in the walls, the conduit, the gas lines, and that 100,000 kitchen equipment becomes 250,000. That bigger that's number what it is. That bigger number depreciates at a much faster rate, and that's whereby you get the savings. Is, is that what, that, you, what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. So if I ask you, Taj or, or Michelle or anybody else out there on that's hearing this conversation, if I ask anybody, would you rather take a deduction today or would you rather wait 39 years for it? And a pushback might be, well, we're doing a lease space over, um, you know, a 10 year lease. Well, as a technical point, more than likely on your tax return, on your depreciation schedule, it's going to show that you're taking that um, improvement of, as you said, 500 grand, Taj, um, over 39 years. In your mind, it's a 10-year asset. And maybe on the book depreciation, you're writing it off over 10 years. But on tax depreciation, which is different, 
which is what drives your tax deductions, it's probably going to show up as a 39 year uh, depreciable life. So what I'm asking you is, would you rather have a deduction today or 39 years from now? Most people would say they'd rather have the deduction today. And um, so what we enable them to do is, like you said, instead of just the equipment they're bringing in of a hundred grand. Now, what if we're adding in another 150 grand they're getting to take on a much more accelerated depreciation basis? In other words, over five years. And on that note, anything done since 2017 has bonus eligibility played into it. So now you can take 100% of what is accelerated, the five and the 15 year items, and take them 100% immediately you don't even have to wait the five years so bonus depreciation is a nice tool that a lot of folks are using to grow their um their portfolio more quickly yeah and and your team you've got uh, a number of cpas on staff what was that count again six six cpas that mm -hmm. do this uh work so we have engineers as well the engineers do the site visits to quantify everything because the IRS requires an actual site visit. They have a document called the audit techniques guide, which is how the IRS communicates to their field agents. So they're folks um, out there that are doing the audits. And so the audit techniques guide says, this is what a cost seg needs to have, needs to have a site visit, needs to have qualified professionals doing it, blah, blah, blah. And that's the team we have assembled over these 26 years now. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for those listening in, if you are a head of construction or the project manager for making sure that the grand opening is met and all the details related to fit out, uh, one way to get in the good graces of your CFO or your finance team is to bring this idea of cost seg to them because you're really on the front lines as the construction lead you're on the front lines of really understanding not just I bought X amount of kitchen equipment. I'm using that as an example to be very literal. Um, but there's so much more that's behind the wall that suddenly it becomes, you know, a much smaller check that you write to Uncle Sam. So uh, that's a that's a a great way to to summarize it. In terms of the savings, right? How how are those savings typically used that you found? within your clients, uh, QSR, or I think you do fitness as well, right? Retail-based services. Yep. So we we do everything from little, I mean, just to put the, the waterfront in, out here on the sure. conversation, we've done everything from short-term like Airbnbs uh, all the way up to skyscraper buildings. So we do everything in between. QSR, yes. We do lab space. We do fitness facilities. So with those in those topics in mind, what our accelerated depreciation enables our client to do, they've typically um, chosen a path. Their path might be QSR, or it might be fitness, or it might be you know lab space. They want to own industrial stuff, medical space, whatever it is. But they usually use the tax deferrals created to redeploy instead of sending down to DC, they get to go buy the next location or get it up and running <clears throat> or be able to fix up the facility that they've got. And it just accelerates their trajectory. That's great. Um, give it, I love the fact that you said, you know, from Airbnbs all the way to skyscrapers within, within the spectrum of multi-unit restaurant service-based retail operators, um, what sizes generally make sense? I, I know you said an investment of at least 200 grand, it it makes sense to do, but um, if you were like a one or two unit operator, does it, does it take up a ton of resources or a five or 10 unit operator? Because everyone's really running around with very lean resources um, to kind of manage the process. And certainly everybody wants to save money but what's what's the trade-off? I mean, how how small of a customer footprint do you work with in this in this market? 
earlier today, I, I got off the phone uh, or off of a Zoom call with yeah. uh, a client and he was complimenting us on when he was originally hearing about this and seeing it, he was afraid it was going to be a heavy lift on his on his arm, shoulders, because he doesn't have a lot of staff um, that is behind the counter, you know, or, you know, back of house. Um, and he thought this was going to be a big kind of hassle. And he was very happy that the results that we were able to deliver to him um, were as strong as they were. And because our team is so efficient and effective and we've done it for so long, um, it wasn't a big debacle for him. He was able to say, okay, here's the time I need you to be at my store. I want you to be there at this time before, you know, everything gets completely revved up. We were there, we did our site visit, got out of their way, and uh, we complied with the audit techniques guide. And we were able to help him without putting him or his general managers, you know, in uh, a stressful situation, if that answers your question. Yeah, it, it does. I think the, the reason I ask it is because the market is so tight. Uh, everyone is, you know, certainly in the back office staff, they're they're wanting to work on strategic things that add value and not the day-to-day -day minutia. Uh, so anytime someone, somebody that we're speaking to in the market that uh, is, is looking at either technology or incredibly powerful services like you have, they say, uh, I'm going to, I'll get back to you in a few months. Well, you know what? You're, you're never going to get any less busy two months from now. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, and so yes. the, it, the important thing is get smart on the subject, talk to experts and then just start uh, because, you know, you have to be sensitive, Jeff. I mean, you and your team have to be certainly sensitive to what makes sense. And, and the, the cool thing is it's, it's it's legal, right? It's this is an incredibly efficient way to save hard earned cash that you want to put back into your investment, you know, your your bank account or your your growth strip plans, your hiring plans. Um, so I, I don't know if, if if that makes sense. If you're if you're seeing the same kind of thing where people are saying, I I better not wait. Well, it's it's a, it's one of those situations. There's a couple of uh, things I'll, I'll mention here. Um, if, if people are paying income tax and they would rather pay less income tax, then this will help them do that. Um, and typically most people in business want to pay less income tax. So we can help them if they're paying income taxes. Number one, number two, I analogize either doing this or not doing this, um, to, a game that many of us grew up playing, or, you know, around the card table uh, back when, and that's Monopoly. And as you're going around the board, everybody probably remembers that um, as you go around the board, there's that um, pass go and pick up $200. And if you remember to pick up the 200 bucks or you know about that rule, you grab the 200 bucks. And if you don't know about the rule or you forgot about that factor and you go around a few times and you haven't picked up your $200, it's not going to kill you. OK, but by the time you've gone around six times and now somebody else has got a hotel on Boardwalk and Park Place, if you land on Boardwalk or Park Place at that time and you haven't picked up six rounds of 200 bucks, you're now $1,200 short of where you could have been. And that could kill you in the game. And that's my point with cost segregation. If you haven't heard about it yet, um, or if you've put it off or you, you know, didn't think it was worth it, I would say you're missing an opportunity that is no different than walking by that $200 every time you go around. Because having the dough, having that reduced income tax payment is going to either make you more competitive, be able to grow faster, reinvest in your business, do something good with it. I mean, maybe maybe for you, that's going out and buying a fishing boat. Well, okay, then go buy a fishing boat. That'll make you happy and then motivate you to go do other things too. But 
whatever it is, keeping that cash yourself, because it's about, it's not about your top line. It's about the bottom line. What do you bring home? And um, that's what the whole idea of accelerated depreciation can, can do for folks. Yeah. And so uh, from a, from a, a lease term perspective, I mean, many franchisees and franchisors, they issue 10 year franchise agreements and those franchisees exercise leases for 10 years, maybe plus, you know, two fives. We got many of them that have, uh, you know, 30 plus years in business at that same location. So you touched on brand refreshes. Um, what's the order magnitude on a, on a, I don't know, let's say a, a brand refresh, typical brand refresh. I know it really depends, but what have you seen? It depends. It, what it depends on is what is spent, what the the brand is requiring. If if it's a, um, let's say a, a coffee shop kind of refresh, maybe the cost would be six or 700 grand. Maybe, maybe it's a million. If it's a Mercedes dealership refresh, um, it's going to be five or 10 million you know, so it just depends. But bottom line, um, my bet is on a refresh of, uh, let's say a coffee shop kind of place, um, that client might save up 75 to $150,000 if it's just a simple refresh versus, you know, having bought the building. And now you've got the opportunity to do the whole building, not just, you know, the five or 600 grand that they're uh, spending for a refresh. Now they've got, maybe they're into it for a mill or a mill two or three or yeah. maybe whatever. Yeah. So the numbers get better and bigger as the purchase price goes up. Sure. Yeah. And the reason I, I'm asking, because from a brand refresh perspective, I mean, these are one of the things that, one of the many things that we track within Lease Cake, the, the option periods, the, uh, the reminders on, you know, key, key things, prior to opening, post-opening permits and licenses. Uh, and, and we're getting some questions here from our, our audience. Uh, and it is very interactive. So feel free to, to keep chiming in. So here, here's a question that just came across, which is, this might be more of tax guidance. So you tell me whether you can answer, Jeff. Uh, accelerated depreciation, certainly understand that, uh, you know, how that works. Can it become a tax credit? Um. No, carry so, or carry over to a future year. You know, if it exceeds current profit. Okay, yeah, because you got to. So I hang out with CPAs all the time, and so I have to be real precise with the language. Because if I say one little thing off off the track, they'll kill me. So <laughs> um, we're creating um, depreciation deductions, which are a deduction against your in um, your top line income. So it reduces what you're often is called an NOI, net operating income. So it reduces that. And so then what you have is the remainder is going to be um, at your tax rate. So whatever we can pull out of the net operating income is going to reduce your taxable income is the bottom line. Well, um, it's so it's not a tax credit, but then Taj, you threw in the thing about a loss carry forward. So the loss carry forward. So if we created so much of an excess deduction for that client, for that property owner or that um, franchisee, if we've created such a nice deduction for them and they can't use it all in that year, it will automatically flow over to the subsequent year. And right. it's called a loss carry forward. Yep. Yep. That's super, super duper helpful. A uh, couple other questions that that came across too. I, I love this. This, uh, this. this is why we call it a webcast, not a webinar. It's not a seminar where we're speaking to to our audience, but it's interactive. So uh, love love these coming across. So for someone who's got a business that's well established with, with no plans to really to grow, do you flatline you you know your your taxes in lieu of ex any acceleration? Um, and this this might be kind of one of those questions we might have to answer offline, but um, I'll read it verbatim. So, for example, you know, whenever you're not expecting any new locations, remodels, uh, how do you consider this against the environment? You know, political, financial, et cetera, corporate tax changes, political changes may need to be considered to maximize your minimum tax liability. 
Ooh, this is like coming from a CFO level. Um, I think there's a, there's a ton of questions in this for someone who's not growing. What do you, what do you think would be the best strategy? Maybe they're not investing in improvements. Well, it depends. Okay. So like you said, there's a lot of things to unpack with that yeah. ring of words there because they weren't like specific questions. There was a, a lot of uh, topics in there. Um, but if, if they're not looking to reduce income taxes, then you wouldn't do this. But if somebody um, could be, or if someone feels like they are better um, stewards of their money than sending cash down to DC, then uh, they would typically do a cost seg because it helps defer tax. It is a tax deferral. And so to clarify, that means we're not giving you um, more depreciation. We're just enabling you to take some of it sooner. Many times accountants will hear about cost seg and go, oh, why would you do that? It's just a timing difference anyway. You're going to get the depreciation anyway. Why would you pay somebody to give you more depreciation? Well, the reason you would have a cost seg study done is because it, um, it, it allows you to take the deduction now, like I was asking earlier, would you rather have the deduction today or do you want to wait 39 years? If, if you've already owned the property more than, say, 15 years, probably not worth it anyway or you know you you haven't done any any kind of significant improvements to the property for 15 years probably doesn't make sense anyway yeah. so our window of opportunity is you know basically anybody that's bought built or improved a space for more than say 200 to 300 grand yeah. um, in the last 12 to 15 years that wants to reduce their income taxes you start to get a few of those other, um, I'll say, sidelines or other parts of that question were talking about the political changes. Um, you know, back in 17, they added in this wrinkle of bonus depreciation that everybody's all jacked up about. And it's great. It it makes cost seg turbocharged. Um, but keep in mind, from 96 to 2017, in that call it 20 year span, we did about 15,000 studies and bonus depreciation never applied to an existing building ever. It was only for new construction. And in 2017 through 2022, they said, hey, anytime you guys buy a building, build a building, renovate a building, or just do leasehold improvements, now bonus is going to apply to all of the above. And what bonus means is anything that's got a depreciate depreciable life of less than 20 years. So the items we identify are five, seven, and 15 year, you get to take an immediate write-off on them. From 17 to 22, it was a hundred percent. In 23, it stepped down to 80%. So any project completed or purchased in 23 was 80% bonus eligible. The balance, 20%, is written off over um, the five and the 15 years, respectively. Mm. And then in 24 now, it's 60%, 25, um, 40%, and 26, 20% 20 bonus eligible. The political conversation becomes the House has passed what their version of the legislation would be to extend retroactively that 100% bonus. Wow. Senate has not yet passed it. Once Senate passes, they'll have to reconcile and make them mirror one another, if that makes sense, the bills from yeah. Senate and House, and then the president would have to sign off on them, if that's where the, pol the political um, part of that question was. Well, nice. Uh, I mean, the fact that you're completely up to date and it sounds like you probably have a, a lobbying group to help protect this because it's oh yeah it's it's an it's it's helping build the american dream right it's continuing to reinforce what we're all here for right yeah absolutely that's and and that's why i love doing what i do because i get to go help people who are very successful in their given chosen field and they've 
somehow, some way, um, controlled real estate, whether they're, they're leasing space or they own buildings, and I get to help them reduce their expenses. Um, and nobody, but nobody uh, complains usually about paying lower income tax. So when I get to help people pay less income tax, they are so happy. So yeah. how, how far back can you reach? Like, well, let's just say hypothetically, uh, investments were made over the past 12 months, but, and they filed their taxes, yet they now just are becoming aware of the power of cost seg. Uh, how would they go back and can you restate and, and refile an amended return? Uh, is there, is that a onerous process or is that even doable? <clears throat> Great question. Another good question there. Um, <laughs> so as, so you, you, you can step back if yeah. you've bought, built, or improved a property, you can step back to 1986 when the tax law changed under the TRA 86. Yeah. Now, usually you won't go back that far because you've already lost the timing benefit. Okay. Yeah. So let's say it's in the last 12 to 15 years. That's kind of the window. And you, the beauty is because you're thinking, Tosh, from your CPA background, you're thinking, oh, what's he talking about? You can't amend that far back, 12 or 15 years. Well, you don't have to amend. So when the tax law and the tax court um, found in favor of uh, this back in 96, they said the way to correct missed depreciation was with a 3115. 3115 is technically, because I'm a tax dork, I know all this stuff. Um, it's a change in accounting method form. So it's the same form you would use to change from cash to accrual or accrual to cash accounting. Well, this form, it's the same form. You're just changing from straight line depreciation to accelerated depreciation. So it's the same form, but the beauty of it is it's automatically accepted and there is no filing fee and you can step back and grab it. So even if they haven't, you know, um, claimed depreciation or accelerated depreciation anytime in the last 10, 12, 15 years. They can now, if they want to, <clears throat> without amending, and it doesn't create a red flag. Wow. That's almost, um, you know, unheard of in the IRS. It's automatically approved and there's no filing fee. So oh, I know it's, <laughs> wow. it's the great, uh, you know. To use the old uh, adage, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> That's wild. Or sliced donuts. Yeah. I, so here's what what we're starting to see in the industry. I mean, there's a ton of M and A private equity investing in uh, adding more brands, more concepts, more locations into a portfolio. Should a cost seg exercise be a part of potentially? due diligence uh, awareness or understanding like to the extent that you're acquiring locations and there's a, a transfer provision in the franchise agreement, you meet all those requirements. Uh, should acquirers be cognizant of this and, and try to exploit those opportunities as well? Might Typically, be yeah. <laughs> well, if you, if you got PE coming in <clears throat> to buy, acquire, you know, a kind of a roll up or, you know, just, picking up whatever the the franchise is um yeah. it's going to help the ultimate buyer um but the fact that maybe the seller did cost segs two years prior doesn't matter because when the seller goes to sell the buyer is buying and the depreciation clock is going to reset yeah. so even if the current owner um is thinking oh i just need to get a few more locations then i'm going to take the exit strategy well having done a cost seg or not done a cost seg won't help or hurt them well it would help them but it wouldn't hurt them to have done it because when the new buyer comes in um theoretically that that clock is going to reset for them got it got it very helpful well i i love how you've simplified you know given the tax code is massively thick and it continues to get you know thicker and thicker and more and more complicated. 
in, in simplifying some of the terminology, right? Accelerated depreciation to provide tax savings today. Would you rather wait 39 and a half years for a, a tax credit or get it now? Mm -hmm. um, your, your team, as you work with many different um, folks in the, in the QSR industry, you got a pretty clever way of making it tangible and uh, at the risk of going into any technical challenges here, I'm going to share with everyone listening in um, how you can look at these kinds of savings differently. So pull this up here. And this is, you know, how would you like to sell, right? 22,565 more Whoppers per location this year. Uh, I think it's really wonderful that you've got hard, tangible proof points uh, with great customers, and many of them are our customers as well. But it it shows you the power of just even one restaurant alone, 103 locations. Um, there's another view here, right, which is how'd you like to sell 50,000 more coffees per location? It's such a great way to simplify it. I mean, people need an easy way to consume and understand the complexities, obviously, of of life and, and business, and certainly a tax code is probably times 10, but how you are, are communicating this and educating your client base, and we're doing our best to make sure that we get this news out, because ultimately, you're never going to be any less busy in two months than you are today. You should start to learn and, and engage. I mean, we've got tons of Dunkin' Donuts operators on the quick serve side and Burger Kings and the RBI family. I mean, you can see the same numbers. It's, it, it's great. It, it's funny. Um, those those are, we um, try to make it as relevant when we go to the various uh, franchises, um, trade shows, because we often attend them. Um, and we're looking for more to attend. So if anybody has trade shows coming up, please ping me an email or a uh, at depreciation doctor on Instagram, DM direct message me or something. But um, the best um, testimonial was we did a um, set of cost segs for a guy in the fitness business and we were at his trade show. And that guy had taken a photo of a refund check he had gotten from the IRS, which was about $800,000. And it was only because of our cost segs and he had gotten a refund check and he pulled out the photo as, as he came up to our booth, as we were there after we had done our presentation and some folks were standing around asking us, you know, chit chat, chit chat at, you know, how a trade show goes. Well, this guy came up and he goes, Hey, I want to show you all this. This is what Jeff did for me. And he's pulled out his phone and on his phone was a picture of the check. And it was, you know, from the treasury department it was amazing and I, and everybody there was like oh my gosh this is real money this is not well yeah we saved them you know 75 dollars or 75 100 dollars it's yeah. multiple yeah. thousands yeah but it's <laughs> did you calculate the roi on that <laughs> oh we did and i i can't remember what it was but i think it was about 90 to one so for every dollar the guy spent he was getting like 90 dollars back now keep in mind it was a fitness facility he owned the facility so there was there were bigger right. numbers but um yeah that was that was a good that was a good testimonial better than our little coffees and, and whoppers but yeah, well, money money is money, and people are looking for ways to get that cash back in their pockets. So that's yeah. very cool. Um, any other best practices? You know, you've you've talked to many different constituents in the market. What are what are some of the other ways that either are coming down the pipe or you know leave no stone unturned? Yeah. Um, so there's a a couple of other things. You know, there's potentially what they call 179D deductions, which are not 179 deductions, but 179D, which involves energy efficiency upgrades to buildings. Um, and depending on, you know, the, the um, franchise group, um, maybe you will qualify for these, maybe you won't. But what it can end up being is potentially up to, under the current legislation, up to $5 a square foot as a tax credit 
So now we're back away from tax deduction, but you can get potentially five dollars uh, for that. And and actually for one seventy nine, it would end up being a deduction as well. So um, you could end up with up to five bucks a square foot as a deduction. Um, if you had multifamily apartments and all, those can be a five thousand dollar tax credit per door. There's a lot of good things there. We also help people reduce their energy expenses if and when they want to talk about energy procurement, but that maybe they've already done that. Um, oftentimes, many people have, but you know, just trying to help with that. Going back to my early days in my career of just helping reduce the drag of unneeded and higher expenses than are needed. Nice. That's good. Uh, more questions are coming in. I, I love it. Let me grab my water. This is not a backdrop, by the way. This is like, this is, you know, we did some leasehold improvements in our space here in Winter Park. Um, but some of the questions that came across are timing um, and and entity type. Let's first start with entity type. Does it, does it make a difference materially, whether you're a C Corp, S Corp, or an LLC? Nope. Uh, it'll work for all of them. Um, and so it doesn't matter. Or it could be a sole prop. You know, if they're if they've got property that they're depreciating, um, this could potentially help them. And one of the things we do, we offer a complimentary for any of Lease Cake's clients or friends or, um, wow, wh whatever. Excellent. We'll offer a complimentary estimate of tax benefit so that the client would end up knowing before they spend a nickel, this is roughly what we're going to save in taxes. This is what it's going to cost me to get. Does it make sense for me to do this? And the way that would work would be most people look at it and say, hey, if I spend a dollar on the study, am I going to get back at least four or five dollars in tax savings? And if so, they move ahead. We hit that ratio, as I mentioned earlier, yep. at yep. about 200 to 300 grand. Um, nice. Well, I mean, you heard it here first. So thank you so much, Jeff, for providing this you know, benefit and service. Because I think, you know, frankly, people are wanting to know that. We talked about limited resources and and how do you evaluate moving forward? I mean, many of our customers are spending that amount of money, certainly on on new openings, uh, whether it's to new developments or retrofitting an existing space. So getting a quick assessment of, okay, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth. I got a construction team anyway. Uh, yes, our CFO wants to save taxes, but how do we get that four to one ratio or five to one ratio? Uh, fantastic. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, timing, let's talk about timing. Should, is it, is it, is it okay to start, you know, when you're just beginning and you're not necessarily throwing off cash, but you're trying to get to, to profitability with a handful of locations or should you wait to, you know, as your profits are growing, tell me what are the trade-offs? So there, I'll, I'll answer a couple of, timing questions because there's yeah. a couple of um moving parts of that particular question so yeah. our turnaround time from getting the basic data in is about 24 to 48 hours we, we can give the estimate very quickly if they chose to move ahead then it would be a six to eight week turnaround time unless somebody really needed it sooner and we can do it more quickly because we do have the bandwidth and capacity to do that that said, if they haven't yet filed the 23, 23 return, they can use the cost seg that we do now for use on the 23 return. Um, if they're in a situation, now I'm getting to the later part of your question there. Um, you know, if you ended up and you're getting your you know, getting the ball rolling and you just don't have that much taxable income right now, maybe it doesn't make sense to do this right now. I mean, we could run the numbers for you and let you know what's on the table, but ultimately the depreciation that we accelerate isn't going to change. What might change is your tax rate. So you, if you're at a very small, low tax rate, if you're in the 15 or 20% tax rate, it's going to look, look less exciting than if you're sitting looking down the barrel of a 35, 37, 39 percent tax bracket with state tax in there, too. So bottom line is we can help if that the client evaluate. Does it make sense? And should they wait? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, 
we believe that we're creating a very big tent and it's the entire ecosystem with lease cake so we're we're bringing in tax experts uh attorneys franchisors lenders you know people that that have capital that are that are funding growth um so i wanted to touch a little bit about cpas do you have programs that you're educating the market or for those listening if if you are a cpa you need cpe credits um do you have programs that would allow our audience to earn continuing professional education credits absolutely so that back in 02 that was really what launched us um into the market is that we started to do continuing ed seminars for cpas so we do them either through the various state societies or we do them through AICPA. If none of the above are convenient or easy or whatever, we can do them for individual firms. We do them throughout the year as well um, on our mm-hmm. own. So we'll have a, not quite as as good as Least Cake Lives, uh, you know, uh, office space there. But we have um, we have some really good um, continuing ed credit um, eligible seminars we do through the year for cpas that's wonderful we we have great cpa partners in fact there's a question that came from one of them just now so uh again technical can you provide some feedback on whether accelerated depreciation is accepted at various state levels or if it's an add back at the state level yeah uh that it varies on the state um, many states have decoupled is technically the, the phrase that is used. So while no. fed, oh, oh, well, let me, let me clarify what I'm saying here. So, um, the depreciation acceleration into five and seven and 15 years is universally accepted from the fed and state returns. What the states have decoupled on some states have decoupled on, um, honoring bonus depreciation. So I was mentioning that 100% bonus on the Fed, that's the way it is. Yeah. On an individual state, for instance, like Massachusetts and many of the New England states, and I'm sure there are other states around as well that have said, nope, we're not going to look at bonus depreciation. So you've got to have a separate depreciation schedule without um, um, acknowledging bonus, if that makes sense. Yep. Wow. Uh, That's one of the reasons that I left my CPA license behind. I I chose to move into audit and not tax. And then when I was in audit, I said, you know what? I like business consulting better. I love the consultative nature of solving clients' problems. Um, And it's just, oh man, I'm so glad there are experts like you and your firm to to really decode this because it's just getting more and more complicated. It really is, you know, and and the House and Senate are battling. And so, but it's, it's, we've been doing this since I've been doing it since 99. Love it. Have, I get up every day and I'm like totally psyched to go help my clients and deliver tax savings. I mean, how does it get better than that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let's, let's talk about advice. You're giving advice to your clients. What was the best advice you ever heard in your career? Um, so I do a lot of work with giving back to various, you know, uh, community members. Mm-hmm. I've chosen to give back to veterans. So we do a lot of fundraising for veterans and their families. And we run a, uh, I'm on the board of a group, uh, called swim with a mission or swam.org. I mentioned that. Nice. And nice. we've raised about $13 million for veterans and their families in the last six years. And wow. we do a lot of work with the Navy SEALs give them a lot of money. That's and... 2 million bucks a year, dude. I mean, I know. I'm, not, I'm not a math expert, but it's, it's slightly over that. That's yeah. incredible. And we do that in two days each summer. So we do some of the most amazing events. Um, swam.org, you can see some of the stuff we do, but it involves Navy SEALs and people want to um, meet these guys. And we do some, we do a big paintball event. And it's the world's largest paintball fundraiser. We beat William Shatner's, who William Shatner had the highest. And then Will Smith took it over from him. And now 
a bunch of people up in New Hampshire have the world record for biggest fundraising with paintball. Wow. That's wild. So it's, wild. It's, it's wild. a, it's a great give back. We, we could have started with that, man, you beat William Shatner's team and that's fun. Yeah. I, it is. And Will Smith, you know, I mean, he's a cool dude. Lots <laughs> of stuff going on. He's got to have some fancy donors, but that we're smoking cool. them. Well, that's cool. Well, we are, we're nearing the the top of the hour. I want to say thank you so much, Jeff Hyde, the depreciation doctor, helping educate our customers and the market. We have a growing list of future Least Cake Live webcasts, and we're calling them webcasts purposefully because it has to be a conversation, right? We're in the education business. So upcoming webinars with Omega Fitness, uh, a, a very a strong brand, part of the self-esteem brands and with work capital. They're adding more locations with technology, a lean team that's able to abstract leases throughout uh, uh, their high level of growth. And they're, I think they're just now announced a, a, a merger between the self-esteem brands and, and uh, Anytime Fitness with Orange Theory. So that's going to be a fascinating topic coming up on May 8th. And also Dave's Hot Chicken, uh, a great customer of ours, a multi-concept supporter uh, and with their leadership team. So very forward thinking. They're going to be talking about mastering growth and strategies to scale efficiently. It's all about being in response to the challenges in today's market, interest rates at, at, a, at the highest rates ever. There's no new development that's coming up for you to move into very easily like there were six, seven, eight, ten years ago. And retail space is so much harder to come by. So we're very excited about bringing in best-in-class thought leaders across the industry. And and Jeff, you and MSC are certainly one of them. So love the vision, love the sharing of ideas, love the sharing of advice. Any last comments, Jeff, before we depart? No, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, allowing me to speak to your crew. And um, thanks a lot and look forward to future collaborations as well. Absolutely. And we'll be sharing this video out, as Michelle uh, had mentioned, making sure that everyone has the latest information and uh, and certainly ways to get in touch with Jeff and his team at MSC. But we are in the education business. We are here to help. And if there's any topics of interest that you wish to uh, have us cover, we are on it. So feel free to shoot me a note, Taj at leastcake.com. And uh, we're ever fortunate to serve you. Thank you so much. Thank you.